Don't look so depressed. Got me? Okay. Here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> Getting all prepared for this, huh? I can do it. Every time I turn on my camera. Like I could I could practice something before and but as soon as I turn the camera on it looks <laughs> I went swimming before I came over here. Did you? Yeah. That was it? It was good. Nice. Yeah. I got a pool back there. That what? is in very dire bad trouble here. I can't figure out what the problem is. What is it? All the water is green. <laughs> now, the pH level is decent and the chlorine levels are really high, so I should not have algae in there, but for some reason, I have green algae showing in the bottom. Yeah. Well, now we're being interrupted already. I lost my train of thought. Oh, Jesus. Shut up, Randy. <laughs> Can't concentrate. Why go inside? Mwah, love you, dear. Love you. All right. Okay. So. Hi, and welcome to the Pursuit of Excellence. I'm Frank. I'm Jimmy. And uh, so, the last couple episodes, uh, the last episode was pretty weak. Yeah, I heard we were pretty slow. It was pretty moving. weak. That's uh, Sam's fault. <laughs> she really kills all, she kills all the motivation that we have. She wants it her way, whatever. She's not allowed on anymore. Ooh. Maybe That's not, not anymore, but that. maybe in the next couple episodes. All right, this, I got her getting this thing, and she just fucking cuts us off, and it's not good. One thing that I've noticed about the episodes is we use the word, and we keep using it, and the word was spectacle. Oh, su no, it was sus susceptible. Susceptible. We've used this word a bunch. Really? Right. And for some reason, I thought a good uh, catchphrase for us, like if we had a poster, is that the pursuit of excellence? Be susceptible to our spectacle. That was like <laughs> if there was a poster, and that would be like the tagline or whatever. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that sounds pretty right. good. Sounds like somebody to Amazon and get a get a poster made. Right. We'll just pose, you know, in a crazy pose. I was thinking the cartoon versions would be good. Cartoon versions would be awesome. I really like Toe Jam and Earl. Do you remember that game? Yes. You know, like yes. Two little alien guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They threw glass bottles to catch humans. Yeah. Or kind of funny. <laughs> kind of dating yourself there a little bit. Whatever. <laughs> there are uh, also in the other episodes. I was. Uh, you you need to stop burping because it's starting to gross me out. Jeez, it kind of hurts my feelings. Well, I don't care. My bad. It's not the loud burps. It's the ones where you try to hold them in. That it's just like. Just burp with force because it's better that way. <laughs> all right, all right. You like burp and then blow it out, and it's like gross. All right. Sorry. Just. Well, we're gonna start off to a critiquing here. Yeah. yeah. Let's see how this is gonna, gonna go. Okay. <laughs> Continue. We're gonna start somewhere. That's all right. Um, I guess that's most of the critiques or whatever. Uh, I was talking about uh, wiping out all your own thoughts. Sometimes you get overwhelmed. Or maybe like a... Uh, people with high anxiety, I think, are a lot like hoarders. Have you seen the show Hoarders? Oh, yes I have. Where they just hoard, just Stuff. fucking piles Everything. of shit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, <laughs> see, I've heard some stories. My brother works at Time Warner Cable. Yeah, yeah. So he goes into a lot of homes, and he's, he's actually been to a few homes, even around here. Really? That were hoarders, yeah. And he said, like, they have, like, this pathway from the door into their living room to where the TV's at, and then they got, like, a little pathway, you know, it's real narrow, and there's, like, stuff toppling, getting ready to pile over on you to get around to where he can hook up the wires and stuff. He's going in there to hook up cable. And he's going in there to hook up cable. He's, he's told me some pretty horrific stories. Like, right. you know, you're walking into this house, and you see, like, a dead cat in a corner that hasn't no been touched. No way. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but, uh, you know, these, these people hoard things, and... This isn't a new occurrence. I remember a uh, Jim Henson movie, The Labyrinth. Do you remember The Labyrinth? That sounds familiar. The 
the girl's got babysit. She wishes the Goblin King would take the baby away, and then he does. Is that the one? That's, well, no. Is that the one that's in the foreign language? No, right? no, no. That's Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, okay. In the foreign right. language in Spanish. This is the Labyrinth. Jim Henson, bunch of puppets. Who the fuck was the guy? The Goblin King. Hold on. I don't think I've seen that one. You had to have. Everyone has. <laughs> All right. Goblin King. David Bowie. What? Well, there's a scene in the Labyrinth where there's a hoarder lady. Did see the hoarder lady? All right, yeah. Where she's got stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. She's trying to like trick the one girl. It's like, you're gonna need this and this and this, and you're gonna need this. No big dolls. No big Yeah. So the premise was people with high anxiety, I think, are a lot like hoarders. Only they do this with their own thoughts. They just they got all this shit they want to do, and they're just hoarding their own thoughts, and this is causing them serious damage pressure at least that's what i think myself i have all these thoughts and that i just i don't want to let them go and i just struggle to hold on to it but i find uh you need to purge them okay. like a uh like when you got a computer oh. and it starts acting all fucking janky mm -hmm. and you what do you do try to fix it you, no no what do you do what's the first thing you do restart it you restart it. reboot you reboot right, that right, part. Right. like this thing's a piece here. of shit <laughs> And then you reboot it. All right. So that's what you need to do with your brain. That's why I write. Do you see all this? I just write all these thoughts down, mm -hmm. and that really helps me. I can I can relate with that, I guess. Yeah. I write I write my thoughts down for different things, different topics. Uh, Sam, I have her write some things down too. When something happens, and she's like real irritated about uh, something at work, you know, she can't get it off the top of her mind, or she can't like let it go. That's a good idea. You type it up, type it up on a Microsoft Word, and save it. And there you go. You've, you've purged yourself of it. You have enough time to think about it and get it the right way. And, and you don't have to worry about forgetting it because you wrote it down. You can go back to it right. if it's that important. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with hoarding your thoughts as a part of the anxiety part. Okay. You're getting, you're getting anxiety, right? So you, like, I guess explain your anxiety, what you get for anxiety. What happens? Physically. I, I just worry about everything. I just worry about all this crap. And then I worry about forgetting about worrying about it. <laughs> so a circle of worrying about forgetting different things. Right. That's why I write it down. Like you said, I write it down. And that's the thing. But the most important part is like, is I think they're super important. So I don't want to forget them. And that's causing me a lot of problems. That's why I write it all down. But I'm good now because I write it all down. It's interesting. I've never thought about it in that sense, like anxiety. Like, you know, uh, I'll get anxiety when I hear certain sound effects. Like perfect? Like perfect? No. No, uh, most of the time it's uh, like uh, the siren that, you, that I used to hear when I was deployed overseas. I'll hear it and I'll start to get that anxiety from the memory flash. I never got anxiety from that. No? No. Yeah. That uh, incoming alarm. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I was annoyed if I was trying to sleep and it went off. I just put a pillow over my head. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was the alarm went off and I felt a rumble within a matter of seconds. Uh -huh. Well, Never I guess happened. I didn't feel it that much. So, yeah. Anyway, I get I get like a, you know that anxiety. I start sweating. I start my heart starts racing real quick. Like that's what I consider anxiety. Anyway, maybe I'm thinking of something different or maybe that's called something different but I start like sweating yeah. and I, my heart starts pounding and I start like I getting fancy like panic attack but uh but see I don't have like a full an extreme form of anxiety mine's not maybe. that extreme maybe maybe but I wanna um I wanted to move over and talk about Bill Murray <laughs> Bill Murray Bill fucking Murray <laughs> awesome He's like, you like his movies don't you big fan Big fan of Bill Murray. Yeah. The Ghostbusters was awesome. Obviously. I love the Ghostbusters. The, the, the new one was terrible. Then the new one was okay. No, it was terrible. It, okay. All right. Well, I didn't mind. Why it was terrible? Yeah, people are going to be like, oh, you're sexist just because they're all women. No, it could have worked, but the characters would have been worked better. But each single character, the reason it didn't work was because right. every single character was trying to be like the comedian. Well, in the original Ghostbusters, there was like the serious guys and the other guys. And then Bill Murray was like the sarcastic funny one. There was only one sarcastic funny one, and the rest of the guys were mostly serious. In the new one, every single lady tried to be wacky and funny. 
And that does not work in a group. You need a group dynamic of different personalities. Well, who says that? No, nope, that's how it works. <laughs> that's, that's how it works to you. I don't know. See, I, I did not mind the new Ghostbusters. I didn't think it was anything near what the original was. And that might have been because of what you're talking about, about the fact that all of them were trying to be too, too comedic. Yeah, dude, so I, there was too much comedy in the story for it to actually be like you know the serious thing. Yeah, I like did, I, did, I barely made it through. It almost made it almost made the storyline for the second Ghostbusters not as believable if you're looking at it. It's not like I put myself as the main character when I'm watching a movie. Right. So like if I'm following through this and the person's being all quirky and weird the whole time, I feel like I'm being all quirky and weird the whole time, and that kind of was like, eh, I don't like, I don't like feeling like that. So. Like in the original Ghostbusters, because there were those serious characters, I felt like it was really happening in New York, or you know, like I really felt like it was occurring, and that I was on the the verge of finding this really awesome, you know, new ghost world. Yeah, that I mean, but you know, continue Bill Murray, the Groundhog's Day. I thought I thought that was good. That it was, was a good one. I've see, I've, I've watched it a few times where you get to that point about just before about the halfway point. Where he's going back in that cycle, and you're just like, man, how many times am I going to watch the same fucking scene play out? But then, as soon as you hit that point, though, it was almost like they, they knew it. The people writing the script knew it. Because it didn't stay there for long enough for you to be like, alright, fuck it, I'm not watching this anymore. You know what I'm talking about? He started to change his routine. It might have been the same thing, but then he was like, fucking around with people. Right. <laughs> that's what made it great. Well, right. right. That, see, that's what I'm talking about. As soon as I get to that point where I'm like, all right, I've, I've seen this already like twice now, they start to throw in the fact that he starts messing around with people, and that's what allowed it to keep moving forward. But I'm just right. saying, just one small error on that part, and that movie wouldn't have been as good as it is. Overall, older movies were written so much better, and they didn't try to rely on all these special effects and stuff. Right. No, I agree with that, for sure. So that's not really... My, okay, so... Anyway, Bill Murray. I don't know if you knew this, but Bill Murray was a student of this guy... Uh, G.I. Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff was like a philosophical teacher. You could call him a guru. I've been listening to a book about him, and I think it's pretty great. What app Gurdjieff. Is that there? What app is that that you're playing there? It's an audio book. You pay money for it? Yeah. Damn. I'd love to have an audio book on, but I ain't paying no damn money for it. How much is it anyway? Curiosity. I pay about like sixteen dollars a month. Hmm. Alright. Interesting. Alright. It's how changing the way you react to misplacing our keys can transform our lives. Sorry! <laughs> she can't help but interrupt, <laughs> even when she's not on. <laughs> That's just who she is. Anyway, you were saying. Booker Jeef. I like his philosophy. She fucking with me now. <laughs> yeah, I think she is. <laughs> yeah. It's getting warm out there. It is getting kind of warm out here. Fuck. That's for death blaring at me. Get out. <laughs> anyway. Fuck. <laughs> anyway. Good chief. A big news guy. How changing the way reacting to your misplaced keys can transform your lives. I see if I react differently to this, I might feel better, but I feel anger and I want to lash out. Right? Change your perception, change your view. Exactly, something like that. Ugh, fuck. Can you turn this light on? Yeah. Seems yeah. probably good. If you actually look up there, I bought the ones that have the light bulb on it and the fan. Oh yeah, that's see it? helpful. Yeah. yeah. I thought so. Okay, the lights on, the fans on. That's a bit better. They're marked. That's great. Yeah. I remember wasting probably a total of a thousand hours now, now that I'm an adult, yeah, just think so. trying to figure out which fucking clicky <laughs> one works. Yeah. See, I always say, I always say, and some of they're always they're all different too. Some of them are different. You'll be sitting there and it's like click, 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 and you're like, damn it, which one is the slow one? Or damn it, which one's the medium one? And you're still trying to figure it out, and you're shutting it on and off, and you can't tell which one's on and which one's off. <laughs> Alright, anyway, sorry. Um, there was another good Bill Murray movie called What About Bob I really liked. Yeah? You told me you told me about this movie, and I have not I have not watched it yet. I don't even know what to explain from it, but okay, so 
Bill Murray was a student of this guy, Gurdjieff, and one of his main philosophies about self-improvement was like self-improvement through self-observation. Mm -hmm. We've mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. Remember, we had this little oh goal. Stay separate and observe. Right. So, uh, so that Bill Murray made a movie called Scrooged. Do you know this movie? You told me about it. I have not seen it either. Do you remember A Christmas Carol? I do remember A Christmas Carol. Do you Carol. know Ebenezer Scrooge? Right, yes. I know this, the character. This is just the live version of that, and Bill Murray plays Ebenezer Scrooge. All right. It's a more modern day. He's like a businessman in a big building. All right. Yeah, Not yeah. like A Christmas Carol where he's a... Uh, he was paper. People of wild horses or whatever the fuck, and there's Tiny Tim or whatever. All right. It's more of a modern day. All right. But still pretty old now, since it's 2017. I think it was made maybe in the 80s. <laughs> All right. Can you give me the basic story of Ebenezer Scrooge? Uh, from what I remember of Ebenezer Scrooge, he's a businessman of sorts. He's uh, the, the person in charge. And he's very grumpy, angry to his peers or to the people that work below him. He's not a very nice guy. Yeah, he's a very, very mean guy. Makes him work on Christmas. Right. So the, the whole premise of it falls along the whole Christmas thing, that he makes everyone work on Christmas, and then he goes home and he goes to sleep, and he's visited by, depending on which one you find, three to five ghosts. Most of the time three. it's three. Well, we'll start with three. Yeah, most most of the time it's three. There has been a few others where they've well, had What do these ghosts do? Uh, now you're messing my knowledge here. Uh, I know that one brings him back to his childhood. But he um, brings him back to his childhood, specifically to do what? To observe who to he observe used to be. To observe how he used to act. Right. Exactly. Who he used to be. This movie is the very embodiment of Gurdjieff's philosophy. The ghosts take Bill Murray, Ebenezer Scrooge, right. to go and actually see himself for what he really is. Mm -hmm. You see, nobody thinks they're the bad guy. Right. Nobody believes they're really mean. Everyone tells Scrooge, you're not a nice person. You're the meanest boss. And he might repeat it back to them, I'm mean and grumpy. Uh, yeah, bah mean. humbug. But no one actually thinks they're the bad guy. Right. And some people are so just unable to see themselves who they really are that they need help. And that's what these ghosts do. They show him the first version of them. The happier kid, and then they show him how he starts to get it become, you know, obsessed with his business, and right. only cares about doing that. And then it shows him how he actually is, and then there's scenes where he's looking, he's like, he, and he, he can't believe that that's him. He's like, that's me. Right. That's how I act. Right. That's how I treat these people. Mm -hmm. And then he has an epiphany, and by the end of the movie, he's like, well, fuck, I don't want to be this guy anymore. Right. And then he changes his way. Right. That's the entire philosophy of this guy. Self improvement. Through self-observation. See, I found that interesting. I, I went to a CPI class. It was a driving ed class. Or not a driving ed class. A driver safety course. Did this turn off? I can't tell. But anyway, I went to the CPI class. And, that, and actually, it was, was touching us. CPI? Yeah, I don't even know what the an acro acronym is. Okay. Are. Anyway, it was, it was about uh, driver safety. And one of the things they were talking about is that nobody thinks that they're the bad driver. Everyone always thinks that the other people on the road are the dangers that you have to watch out for. But, see, you also have those people that are driving and doing 90. You know, and they still think that they're the good driver, and everyone else is just driving way too slow. You have those days where you're driving, and you're, you're very cautious, and you're checking your mirrors, and you're being super safe, and you're okay. But you also have those days that you get into your car after getting into an argument, or into having a bad day at work, and you're driving, and you're not thinking clearly, and you're not paying attention, and you are going too fast, and you are whipping in front of people, and you're doing bad things, but nobody ever thinks that. See, everyone, when you ask them, is like, you know, how many, how, how many people, people here think that they're good drivers? And everyone will raise their hand. Well, if yeah, that's the case, obviously. then why are there bad drivers out on the road? Exactly. And so I guess that kind of incorporates yeah, exactly. your theory. No, totally. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, no, that was good. Another thing he says is that uh, a lot of people are moving mechanically through life. Like, some people might make you angry or you get upset about what they do, but a lot of times you need to realize that sometimes these people don't even realize what they're doing in the first place. Because they're just, you know, when you do the same thing every day and go to your job, you kind of go in a little bit of an autopilot and you're moving mechanically throughout the day, just trying yeah. to make it so you can finally get home. So I've always... I've always per uh, perceived things or, or tried to look at things, and they, they call it like uh, emotional intelligence or putting yourself in the other person's shoes in yes. a sense. 
But you ever go to the grocery store and you're you're, you're pushing your cart around and you hear that that mom who's screaming at their kid like super loud and, and they seem like the angriest person in the world or like wow that lady's a bitch you know or whatever you know well when I hear that stuff and, and, and like you can you can see people like reacting to it like wow what a you know bitch yeah and then they're looking at it and I always look in that situation like. Maybe, she, maybe, she, maybe that lady is actually a really nice person. She's just at her ends, you know. She's she's on her, on her last straw today. Right. Maybe that kid pushed her over the limit this time, and it's like she, you know, she's she's had it up to here. She can't handle it. That's that's how she's she's acting this way. Right. But the way that we're perceiving it, the way that people see that incident every single time is this: that lady's a bitch, or that person's a you know an asshole, you know. And it, it kind of ties in with with everything. I think. Just. People are moving mechanically in that sense that oh, people always think that they're right and they're they're thinking the right way and everyone else is thinking it's the wrong way. And so when things aren't happening the way they think it should be happening, they get mad. Right. They get mad or maybe embarrassed. Um, I think in the very beginning I, I said something about feeling uneasy because the camera's on. What the fuck? How is other people? All right. Elaborate on that one. It's about being observed. You, when you know you're being watched by someone else, that's when you start to act a bit differently. Maybe you put up barriers. Maybe something you normally wouldn't agree to, you do agree to. Because I think a lot of people's inner dialogue, when, whether they're you know conscious or not conscious of it, everyone's inner dialogue is like, do they know something more about life? Are they doing it better than me? Why are they so confident in what they're doing right now? You know, so because yeah. we're always looking for, because you know we're looking for. I keep, we look at others for examples and approval. We seek affirmations. We are doing it life right. So we're constantly. That's why we're constantly looking and judging other people. Right. I agree. See, uh, uh, do you remember, I don't know, this is, this is kind of pushing me back to high school here. Do you remember reading a story, and there, there was a story about uh, this, you're on the side of a, a guy with a gun, and he's coming up, and he's, I, I think he like kidnaps the family or something along those lines, but he's got a gun to this, this person's head, and the way that they're acting, the entire time that they have the gun to their head, it's as, as if they were, you know, the most kind-hearted, polite person ever, because they're trying to plead for their life, in a sense. And there's a quote in there, and I cannot remember the quote for the life of me, but it was something along the lines of, of what you're saying there, that, uh, like, you change the way that you're doing things. And he says something along the lines of, like, this lady would have been one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life if she would have acted the way that she does every day of her life like she does with this gun to her head, you know, or, or toward the end of her life, or whatever. And then, you know, of course the story gets south and he shoots her in the head anyway, oh, whatever, like yeah. the story actually ends that way. It's, Wait, was it in high school? Yeah, it was, it was like high school. Maybe it was college. It might have been college. I don't know, but it was, it, it was an interesting story that, 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 that kind of ties along in that light. Uh, that whole, we, we're always seeking approval or looking for examples yeah. of what other people are doing. Yeah. And what's interesting is when you really take a step back and look at it, a lot of people are doing the same thing that we're doing at the same time. So that person had observed somebody else and decided, I want to be confident in this factor that I'm going to go do this, and they're going to do it. But then when we're observing it, we're seeing them being all confident, even though they weren't just 10 minutes ago or five minutes ago or the day before. Yeah. You know? They, uh... A lot of times, just looking at other people, they seem... They have it together. I so feel yes. like that when I come over here all the time. I just think I'm bothering you guys. Like, I have a house and a family, and I'm like, hey, you want to do this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it just takes some planning. It takes some planning. No, it, it is what it is. But you're talking about religion. I see this but, uh, before, we, before we move on here. I see this, this almost as a, a problem, though, too. A problem? Why? Yeah. Because we're always... We're always comparing, and I feel like the, the, the comparing 
of ourselves to others is not necessarily the right way of going about and doing things. If, for example, well, we have to compare it to something, but we don't. We How don't. do I know I'm living my life right? If see, see, here's here's an interesting thought. Okay, perception becomes reality, but yes. we don't all see what's truly going on. For yes. example, people can idol, idolize, or take their role model as some famous person, right? For example, you don't know what's actually going on in their everyday life. All you see is what's projected out for us to see. So you don't know the actual inner working. So somebody could be like, oh, I'm watching the, you know. I, I want our relationship to be just like so and so's relationship. You know, I want our relationship to be just like that. But all you're really getting you, is a part of that. You see, maybe, uh, yeah, you see a part of it. Maybe you see the happy relationship. But what we don't see is the most important part, and that is the work that right. I put into that. That's right. another part of just guy G. I. Gurdjieff's philosophy. Like you have to put in the work. It's not just the answer, right. it's the tools, the keys that you use to guide yourself. It's uh, a constant... That was, that was pretty perfect timing there. This constant working in your camera's like, I'm gonna stop working right now. <laughs> <laughs> practice. <laughs> it's a constant working practice. You have to work at it every single day. Right. Some days you'll be bad, some days you'll be rough, other days you'll be focused and you'll be in, and it's just, that, that's the whole thing. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But yeah, people, so we're constantly comparing, we're defining ourselves based on the comparison of ourselves to other people and how we're going to make ourselves better. But what we're not seeing is just the, 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 the in-depth work, like you're saying, the in-depth work that they did to get where they are, or the in-depth work that they didn't do to get where they are. So when you're looking at yourself and you're comparing a relationship, I'm like, I'm so much better than this couple. Maybe they're not putting in the work that you're putting into. So maybe you should, instead of comparing yourself there, just be taking the appreciation that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. Or on the opposing side, I can look at myself now and go, well, I got a decent house, right? I, it, you think I got a decent house? Yes. All right. But if I'm comparing myself to the guy, you know, I don't know, 12 houses down on the, the left who's got a mansion who's got a 10 bedroom, four bath with a, you know, in ground pool and all this other cool stuff. And I'm looking at it going, well, damn, I ain't got all that stuff. He must be doing way better than I am. But at the same time, what I don't see and what I don't know is maybe, maybe that dude isn't as, as, as good as I am. Maybe that dude is at, at his house beating his wife and I have no idea. Yeah, he could have all the, um, phys physical things, products, stuff in the world. Mm -hmm. To be way more miserable than you. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe that guy is actually a very terrible person with all this stuff. Or maybe he's a really cool person, but he doesn't have what I see. It doesn't mean, yeah, it doesn't mean he's happy. You ever see those videos but with the homeless people where they give them like the hundred bucks and they see what they do? And yeah. everyone's perception is like, you know, these homeless people are very terrible people that are going to go out and get drunk. And I'm sure, I'm not saying that they haven't cut out all the other people that did take the money. Of course they oh, cut oh. those out. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of them that do that. But yeah, there's a couple that get the money and they go to a grocery store and then they come to like a park where there's other homeless people and they start passing shit out. Yeah, or I've seen, yeah, yeah, like they, they go back to their little thing and they, they have all this stuff. Or like I've seen the one that literally just went and bought the basics. Went and bought a pillow, a blanket, and uh, you know, a, <laughs> came out with a stack of Lunchables, you know, and he just went back to his spot and sat down and ate. It's like, well, he knows, you know. And I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure there, there was, was a, uh, or more of them. homeless people. I remember seeing these fucking videos that annoyed <clears> me, <throat> where there'd be a homeless person. He wasn't really homeless, but he'd sit out there, and he had a sign, and it'd be like a wacky sign, like, you need money for drugs? And I'd go, oh, right. and be a homeless, and then everyone would just, like, give him fucking money. Right. And then they'd change it, and, it'd be, and then it'd be more sadder, and he'd have like a little girl there with him, like need money for family, and nobody gave him shit. <laughs> yeah. But there's uh, there's logic and reason behind this. Oh, so I'm sure. It's so a lot of thing is always uh, when you're walking through life, how you relate to stuff is based on yourself. Everything's like a reflection of self. All right. So yeah. How you think and feel about certain things. We so define and we compare. With the guy with the fun sign, mm. makes you feel good and happy and joyful because he's having a good time and you're like fuck it this guy's having a good time that helped improve my day just need money for drugs and alcohol fuck it woo party on dude and then you walk by and you see the other one where it's like he's all sad and depressed and like with this fucking pathetic piece of shit get the job and you're just like it makes you angry right <laughs> it's like need money for your family i need money for my family what are you talking about yeah see well 
See, we were talking. We were talking about. I don't know, we weren't talking about it, but I was talking about it with somebody recently, and it was about like just people in general. Like, I'll see people on the side of the road, you know, flat tire something on the side of the road, and you're driving, and you're like, "Man, I should probably stop and help this person." Right now, but that's your first thought. You're like, "Man, I should probably stop and help this person." That'd be the right thing to do. If I had a flat tire, I'd want somebody to help me. And in fact. When I was in South Carolina, I did get a flat tire. And I was on the side of the road, on a highway, in a state I'm not familiar with. Yeah. And some guy did stop and help us. Oh, that's great. You know, and that was nice. But as I'm driving and I see these people parked on the side of the road, I always immediately snap to all of these different videos and news articles about very bad things happening. Oh, and maybe yeah. it's because we as Americans all together watch way too many horror films. Or, or maybe it is the, the fact that there's, there are these people out there, but you're putting yourself in danger by stopping and helping this person. I'm sure that probably 99% or 90% of the time, if you were to stop and help that person on the side of the road, it'd be all good. Yes. And they'd appreciate it. Definitely. But is it worth the risk of that 10% where you're going to stop and get beat in the face with a tire iron and all your money's stolen? Uh, no. Right. But I... Again, it's yeah. Not, you're trying to convince yourself. Make yourself feel better. I should stop. But what if he hits me with a crowbar? Oh, well, yeah, it's similar you to that. Like you, always, you don't want to help your fellow. I'm just, I, wouldn't, I don't stop either. Now, interestingly I, enough, I've, I've drove by, had a thought like, I should help him. You know what? No. Interestingly enough, one thing that I always do, and I don't know why I do it, but one thing that I've always done, when I was living in Texas, it was bad because in Texas they had so many car accidents. It was like, they had a car accident every hour or something, and it was on their radio. Like, they put it out there. One car accident occurs every hour or whatever. Uh, and so I saw a lot of car accidents there, but every time I see a car accident, I stop and I help. I don't know why. But I will pull my car off on the side of the road and I'll go make sure that that person's okay. And I will call the police for them if they need to, or the ambulance if but, they need it. But now you won't. But I, no, I will now. No, but what I'm saying is, interestingly enough, I won't help the guy on the side of the road with a flat tire. Or, you know, the, the person that looks like they, they need help stranded on the side of the road somewhere. But I will help somebody that just got into a car accident. Even though those two people could be the same people. You know what I'm saying? I could have stopped and helped that guy when he was in a car accident, but then I see the same car on the side of the road two months later, and I won't stop because it's uh, you know a different scenario, different different circumstance. Well, maybe I'll contemplate helping someone change a tire. Yeah, maybe. but I probably won't. That's but if I have is. a flat tire, you goddamn you better help me out. <laughs> somebody better stop, can, damn it! I don't know. I don't want to do that. Until then, uh, I'd say this is. The end. All right. So. I feel like this uh, has been pretty productive. Yes. What do you think? Yeah. I think this yeah. is a lot better. I feel good. A lot better. All right. A lot, lot, lot less interruptions. <laughs> Help me get my full thought out there before okay. someone shouts like, "I, I remember there was a dog." I'm sorry. I'm trying to make fun of your wife hey, right now. This is my <laughs> wife you're talking about. <laughs> Come on. Logan hit some potato chip. Oh, sorry. Just... See, now you're bringing, bringing my son involved in here? What is wrong with you, sir? So, anyway. Uh, I'm Frank. I'm Jimmy. This has been a successful episode of The Pursuit of Excellence. And uh, until next time, goodbye. Bye.